Hello, people. I'm still on my own today. So I'm going to start the video. I'm a bit late today. Um, so I'm going to wait for some people to join in while I'm having my cup. Up. It might be because I am late and I completely forgot to put it on Instagram. And uh, so one, two, yeah, people are starting to join in. Hello. <laughs> Sorry, guys, that I am late today. Uh, I have uh, a few things to do at the workshop and I'm having some snacks as well as we're here. Uh, so today we're going to talk a little bit about um, the air density, um, which is extremely important. So we keep on talking about the, everything the engine does and uh, what the, the best way to get uh, the most out of it and everything. But uh, many people um, ignore completely the one of the most important things, which is the, the air the, the engine is actually taking in. The temperature and humidity uh, contained on the air will reduce that the air density. The more humidity you have on it, the more water it has on it, which is not a good thing. Um, so you really want cold and dry air, which of course in the UK it's uh, almost impossible to get. Uh, at the moment we got uh, cold but very humid. So like recently, most dino tunes I've been doing, it has been around between the eight to 90 percent so it's very humid it's it's not good but the loss of density becomes worse with temperature so when it's hot the hotter it is the the less dense it becomes so behind me on the board i've written a few numbers um now the, the impact this is going to have is quite it can be quite big um like uh, dinos have a correction factor for the, the temperature and humidity. But um, the problem with that is it reads the atmospheric temperature and pressure. It doesn't really read your intake air temperature to correct it from the intake air temperature. So the thing is by doing that, if you were doing that, if you input, let's say the value on the dyno by your intake air temperature, you could have uh, like the, um, the potential power the engine could make, but then you would have to offset. You have to do two readings: one with the the sensor outside, and the other one with the sensor on the engine bay. So then you will see how much power you're losing through the hot air the engine is taking in. So in here we got just a few examples. This is quick. Uh, like I put everything within the same numbers. The only things I've changed was the humidity. So you guys see the effect humidity has and how far you have to go on humidity to really actually make a small difference. And in temperature, like how much smaller you change temperature and the difference in density, how much bigger it becomes. So let's start with the condition typical in UK. Uh, I don't know if you guys can see it well, but we got here 1000 HPA as the, I'm using this number as the atmospheric pressure, which is around that usually. 10 degrees, okay, so it's not a hot day. 90% humidity, which is, I've been seeing this recently. We got an air density of 1.225, okay. And then now we say, okay, and let's put it on a dry day then, the same temperature, but on a dry day. What would be the air density? So we got exactly the same 1,000 uh, HPA. 10 degrees, but we go to 30% humidity, you know, this is really low humidity, 30%. Uh, we got a net density of 1.228. So the difference is very minimal. From uh, 0.225 to 0.228, that's a uh, 0 0.003 difference, or a difference of 60% like from uh, not 60 percent total but 60 percent uh, of uh, one value to the other 30 to 90 it's 60 so it's quite a big increase now if we go then to see the air temperature let's say 
same humidity, 30%, but now it's 20 degrees. It's summertime. The air density, we just went up by 10 degrees and the air density went to 1.185. It's a big drop in density. You see, we gained density when we lost humidity, but we, we lost a lot of humidity. Uh, so that would make a little bit of a, a difference on the power. It would be very minimal. Uh, but now, if we go up 10 degrees, which is easy to happen, especially on ca on a car, like if you have your filter to fit in the wrong place, all of a sudden, you lost a lot of air density. Um, so it goes to 1.185. And then it can get even worse. If we, if we level to 40 degrees, which... It, it can happen. I, I've done a lot uh, a long time ago when I was uh, testing the, the first engine on the 116. Um, I was on the dyno and the, their dyno didn't have the best uh, cooling thing on it. And even knowing that I had a cold air fitted on the car, my intake temp was at 45 degrees. I will never forget that. Now, you come to 40 degrees from 20 to 40 degrees and it goes down to 1.10. This is a big uh, drop in density, and you will definitely feel the power difference with this. It's when the car starts to become less responsive, the air fires go wrong, it doesn't, it, the engine doesn't make the same power because it has no density. And of course, the higher you go, the worse it becomes. And usually what I've seen um, on most engines, uh, for 10 degrees, you see around two to 3% loss of power. Okay, power and torque. So we lose this through the old curve. Um, this is like what I usually see. It doesn't mean it's exactly like that, but what I have seen, it's this. This is what uh, I have uh, experienced myself. Like some people might have experienced different, but I'm talking from my experience, from the, the things I have tested. So getting the story short, Humidity, it has an impact, not as much. I would say going 60% different the difference on humidity. You wouldn't really tell the difference. It would be one BHP different. Um, but going up in temperature, you will definitely see like a big drop, especially if you went to like 40 degrees. And generally, it's very easy to get 40 degrees on the intake temp because that's lower than what usually your engine bay is. Your engine bay is usually around 50 to 60 degrees inside with the bonnet closed. Uh, if the car is not moving at all, it's, it becomes really hot. It, you know, it, it might, you can, I'm sure you understand it goes a lot hotter than that. But, um, so this is the thing. Um, important, like, as important as everything I, I have explained before, all starts in here. It's the quality of air your car breathes, the, the quality of air your car takes in. Um, so this, this will, uh, will express it better. Other things, I'm, I'm about to do some testing, uh, not this week, coming I mean following week. I got my tools to start measuring atmospheric density. So when I'm on the dyno, I'm going to measure the difference between the atmospheric density and the density inside the plenums of my intake manifolds. Um, this will show me how efficient my intake manifolds are on filling themselves up. Um, gives me also a good reading if I need a bigger throttle value or not. Um, also, it gives me the power potential the engine is going to have. So I'll have to calculate the differences. Um, so this thing. Now, uh, I want to clean this word because now I'm going to go to square one. And uh, recently, I have quite a lot of uh, people asking very different questions um, on my thing. And uh, one, one thing I'm noticing is some people um, try to use the, the math I supplied in here in order to try to guess something on, on the engine or try to, to make it to, to see the gain or the, the loss they're going to have. No. For example, I'm going to talk about the port speed one, which is extremely important. It's proper math, and it's a very good uh, baseline for it. 
That thing is good. Like if you already have had the re read of your in the head, if you know the port speed of the head, that will tell you the potential port speed the head has. So it's a theoretical port speed. Um, the head should do that speed um, at the, that at that RPM. The the other thing is on the port speed. There's so many variants. You change your lift, you change the port speed. You change the runner diameter, you change port speed. You change the runner length, it changes the port speed. You change the load of the engine, it changes the port speed. So you, the that thing works to anal to do an, an analysis like how much it's going to drop. So if you had already an engine that you tested, okay, and uh, you know the data for the cylinder head, so you know how much it has flowed, how much was the port speed at that lift. You can run the data back to back and uh, try to see it theoretically, like what your engine does in theory. And where does this help? It helps for you to try to understand what do you need in terms of cam, how much RPM you're going to be needing to do. And because you know with a certain port speed on a certain lift, you have a certain CFM. And you know you need a certain amount of CFM to make X amount of power. Therefore, when you have the number of the power your car is making, okay, you know how much CFM the car is consuming. Then you run that against the lift you have. Then you calculate the, the, the port speed, or if you don't have the data for the port speed, and you can actually see how much air the engine is sucking in precisely. Not uh, the, what I mean is the, the pressure drop the engine will have. And from there, you, you know how much more RPM you need to put it on and what cam you need. The other thing is, you will see as well, like the, an engine will make the maximum power at a certain RPM, okay? And on one of the videos, the, 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 the first videos, I taught you guys like how to calculate the duration in time that the, the valve stays open. And like the good thing about this is, you know it makes max power with that opening time, but let's say to reach a certain port speed, you will need to increase the RPM so it brings to that port speed. And what you have to do then to get more power out of it, because you know with the, the, the let's, let's, I have to exemplify in here so you guys don't get too confused. Let's say we got at the point 400 of lift, so 400 cell of lift, we got 240 CFM, and the port speed, the average port speed is around 300 feet per second. Okay? Now, we know. 240 CFM to calculate the potential, the the max power you should do on this 40 CFM. You have to go 40 multiplied by the number of cylinders. This is a four cylinder, and then you multiply again by 0.26. Okay, and this will tell you how much power you can make with this. So we now go to here and see. 40 times 4 times 0.26. And this is good to make 249.6. Okay, now you put the, this head on the cap, okay, and uh, you say, I'm so far from the 249 BHP. Why? Again, because you will not have enough duration in time on the cam to reach the intended, R intended RPM to make this power. So let's say you are making, like this is an example, I'm not even specifying the displacement because it's not required at all. It will be required to calculate the port speed, theoretical port speed, but we will not need it. So you know to make this power, your port has to be at this speed when you're making the maximum power. It will be on that level, on the 300 feet per second, okay? But then you are only making 160 HP, okay? And you're like, I'm only making 160. Well, it's easy. 
All you have to do is reverse this formula, and then you see how much are you taking. So, 160 HP, you have to go and divide that by 0.26 divided by the 4 billion. Okay? Divided by 0.26 divided by 4. Okay, so you are using this is equal 153.8 CFM. Still missing a lot to the 240 CFM. Your engine is not sucking enough air, so it's not revving enough, or there's something blocking it. But let's let's work on the basis. There's no restrictions on the intake. So. From here to here, you see like how far out you are. So you are actually only using sixty four percent of the cylinder head. So that is still a big margin. So you use sixty four percent of what your head can do. And generally, this is something that happened in most cases. And as I explained before to you guys, it's um, it's only you need camshafts to expose the cylinder head. So you're only serving 64% of the head with the, the setup on this example of an engine. Now, when then it, it flows to 240 CFM um, with 300 feet per second. So we know we're not getting the 300 feet per, feet per second. So we, what we have to do is correlate one with the other, and uh, we know like the port speed we are doing, or we know how much vacuum the engine is producing at this um, 153. And I think off the top of my head, I think it's going to be around 12 inches. So. No, I know it's one point. Now this 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 conversion I know by heart, so I'm going to do it, and I'll I'll tell you when I'm sure it's the right one. One four three. So if it was ten inches, it would be one four three. So it's it's more than that. I said it would be around twelve. I think twelve is one point six. Um. And it's very close, not 12. This one. Okay, 156. So it's the sucking pressure of the engine to make this power is 15 inches drop. Okay? So this is the, the way you measure like the, the vacuum, the, the suction of it. So you know we're not getting enough sucking. So there's no, it's not sucking enough. This is why it has less power. Now, how can you increase this? Easy. More RPM, it will suck more in, or bigger displacement. This is why they say there's no replacement for displacement, only because it can suck more in, nothing else. Um, but again, going back to what I spoke on the one of the previous episodes, you just give it more RPM. So you know you have 15 inches drop to let's say 6,000 RPM to get to 28. How much do you need? Simple. And uh, let's let's try to find out. Okay. You would need <laughs> quite a lot. 11,200 RPM. Motorbikes. <laughs> so, we, you know, if you're revving that engine to 11,200 RPM, you would be using the cylinder head. Ta -da. But of course, then, how do you get to there? You see how much duration in time you have at 6,000 RPM. You calculate it 
to have the same duration in time at 11,200, and you end up with the duration of CAM you should use to get there, which for this RPM, I, I'm sure it's going to be over 300 degrees of lift at one mil, um, which is a lot. I think the biggest CAM I've seen was 310 at one mil, which was 362 degrees um, total duration. Crazy. It's absolutely. So this is the thing, and then you will have the 300 feet per second. Now, you might not have it. This is the thing, you might not have it and still make this power. But it means you're going to be making this power further down the line. So it's uh, it's uh, one of those things that comes down to everything is to be critically thought of in order for the things to work. You know, like... Uh, I, I explained to people it's not about uh, making just the power, it's about making the power a quick power. It's so you need the torque and uh, the, this is the thing, you know. So you have to think logically. You cannot the, the, just to try to guess the port speed you have on an engine you never seen inside or you don't understand what port speed actually does. Uh, I explained roughly what it does in here, but the problem is there is so much more that just this like I cannot take it to the full depth of it because I think it, 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 it you need a lot of time. It's you need a lot of uh, explaining, and you guys need to be more into trying to understand what it does. And uh, again, an engine is just an air pump, so it's just moving air in and out. And this is why it's possible for small engines to make big make, to make big power. It's just they revving really high. You know, it's it's Pardon, one of those things. So, but the the thing is, the power is one. It's it's another misconception on its own. Because it's not all about power on a car. It's all about the balance of the car. Of course, depending on the way you look at cars. But to me, a good car is a car that has a good compromise between the right cornering, the right braking, the right power, the right acceleration. And there's only so much you can do with power. You know, you can make something really crazy, but then if you if you don't make it right, it's just not going to be something you can drive on the same manner. You know, like for example, the, these N44 engines I'm building at the moment, the ones that are running, are engines that you can you can put on a car, a normal car, and drive it normal. It drives completely normal, like a normal car. It's the the vanos is still fully operational. It still has all the good sides of the stock engine, with the good sides of a performance engine. It's the right compromise. On the two liter one that we're doing, is going to to start to become a little bit different with the new cams we're putting on it. But it still doesn't go out of its uh, drivability zone or anything. But more than that, I wouldn't like to do it. Um, and the thing is, it's going to make around 20 VHP more with the new cams than what it has at the moment. Um, it's going to make a bit more RPM. But even as it is, it's already fairly quick um, because it has a big number on average power. And again, I explained to you guys what the average power does. So that's the thing. Like I, I, I'm very tired. At the moment, like uh, not tired of doing the video, of tired now, is I am just uh, a bit tired of seeing people building things the wrong way. And the, the the worst part of it is I stopped now giving advice on them because I almost got thrown out, or they <laughs> they I start getting told off uh, because it's almost for me to giving them advice, free advice. Um, just for them to try to get the best result out of it, I get almost condemned. They try to the 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 answers like the way they answer to me. It's not uh, it's not ideal in any way, shape, or form. And the one, for example, myself, if someone is doing something I haven't seen, I like to look at it and see the way it was done and understand what's done. If I see the thing is, if I see something that I don't think it's right, I used to say oh, it's not right. You probably could do it a different way. I don't do that no more. It's pointless. People take it the wrong way. If people want my advice, they will come and ask for my advice. Um, 
but at the same time, sometimes people ask for advice, but they do something else. So I just decided to stop doing that completely. I give full advice to my customers, whoever they ask. I try to explain people how things work uh, as best as I can, you know. And uh, of course, I cannot go full depth again into it because this is a science you, you don't learn in two days. There's a lot more to it because then there's other thing is theory adds up really nicely. It does work really well when you understand the theory. But when it, you start working with the, the practical side of it is when you start really learning to the different level. And I still learning till today, like what something does. I'm still as curious as I was before, because to me, I come to the conclusion that the more I know, the less the the the, the less I I know almost. Because the more I know, the more I realize how much more depth it is in it. So it's I I know things nowadays about the science behind an engine I never expected to know, and uh, I think around two years ago. I was uh, talking, commenting with a friend of mine, and I said, I'm on a, a level I struggle to, to learn with other people because I don't see people having the knowledge I need now to learn from them. So that's when I started studying it myself and go behind the science, learning the physics as well, I, I fluid dynamics. I studied all of that to understand how an engine works. And uh, on the past two years, I think it's the, the years of this that I learned the most and made me understand. Them. So especially, I would say, the, since BDS Motorsport started, um, the builds we had are far more assertive than before. So we point to a result and it comes down to that. It's because we are basing ourselves more on the science behind an engine than uh, just, uh, ah, you put this plus this, it will work. It's not quite like that. It's just uh, spending the extra time on uh, understanding what works and what doesn't. And But even still, I still do a lot of tests. I still dyno the cars far more than what they, sh they should be dyno to, to tune them just because I want them to be as best as they can. And at the end, I still want them to drive really nicely. Um, so that's the thing. Now, I'm going to open the the thing for us for for you guys to to start asking some questions i don't think i have any question from past one uh, i'm going to have a look now just a second on my phone let me see what i want my phone is having a bit of a fit at the moment it's decided the past 24 hours, this side turned itself off uh, five times. Uh, now, ah, okay. I got uh, Eric Engstrong eight hours ago. Hello, I, I haven't even seen this. Um, I cannot even open it. <laughs> Hello from California. I've heard you doing interesting things like evidence-based modification of engine. Love to see and interact. We do a lot of larger MS41, MS42, MS43 DMEs and engines. Okay, good. Um, doesn't say anymore. Then JDM Car Clinic, do, can you recommend any engine math science book? Yes, but I don't know the name of them by heart. Um, so you have to do some research. There's, there's some that you will not find online. Um, or you will have to, to really know their name to find online. Um, no, I got one from Adrian two days ago. Wow, this is long. Adrian, this is like a book. Uh, you guys cannot see it. Huge. <laughs> so, I've tried to make it as short as possible. When tuning a stock engine and the goal is a fast road car, do we need to apply a margin of safety in the tune for reliability under extreme operating conditions. This is one thing and I'm going to read the rest. An example of extreme operating conditions, I'm thinking of having five people in the car, full tank of fuel, carrying maximum payload in the boot, towing trailer at maximum brake towing capacity, while going up a hill at 80 miles per hour. On, on a day where the ambient air temperature is 45 degrees with the, um, 
45 degrees with uh, high humidity and while being at uh, 1,000 feet above sea level. Wow, this is really extreme and it's mentioned here, it's really extreme. I ask uh, this question because I've heard it so many people from many different people. If your engine is stock, you should only use OE factory tune because having uh, no new engine hardware is not going to change the performance without sacrificing reliability. Uh, they spend, manufacturers spend million dollars on research and development. Do extreme operating conditions affect an engine reliability? If the tune doesn't have a safe margin, from my understanding, providing AFR is correct and the engine is not experienced pre-ignition detonation knock, then it will be reliable. Uh, I know it is probably more complicated than that, but this is my simple understanding. Okay. Yeah, you are right. Your understanding is right. Um, I, I, keep, I, I keep on saying to people, reliability um, has more to do with the owners than the engine itself. Um, because reliability is going to be directly related to the way you look after the engine, the maintenance you do to the engine, the oil you use on the engine, the way you drive it is extremely important. Uh, I'm, not, I'm not saying if you are a good driver or a bad driver, or the way you drive it at the wrong time is like, if you keep on launching your car in first gear, it, it's not going to be good. Doesn't matter how good it is, even on the standard engine, it's not going to last. Um, now, if you don't warm the things up properly, you need to have uh, a lot of uh, care when you have a tuned engine. But like this, the example is giving is like just uh, on a standard engine, just with a modified map. Unless the map is really badly done, you shouldn't have any issues with it. You know, it's uh, the thing is they spend a lot of money on R and D, but they they do have to follow certain rules and most of, our, of their R&D is to follow those rules than necessarily for the engine to last as long as it can. Um, I don't think nowadays uh, companies are putting a lot of effort into making their engines last because if that was the case, you wouldn't see big manufacturers like BMW, Volkswagen, like old Mercedes, all these engines nowadays, they don't last. They're not like before, they used to last a lot longer. But I, I, I put the blame of this on something else, is the long life oils. As much as they are more efficient than the earlier oils, I still think doing 12,000 miles on an oil, it's too much. It's not something I would do. And this, this of course, will increase the risk of engine failure. Um, Nowadays, we have more technology than ever before, so things can be done, but still, there's certain certain things. You cannot really base a service on the mileage only, you know. You have to think about how long the car is staying on traffic, all these things. So, the an engine being reliable is so subjective to the application, it, so or to the to the owner of the car, that is, is, very, is a very hard thing to talk about, because to put it that way, there's no harsher extreme than a race circuit. Okay, you are flat out all the time, off the throttle, on the throttle, off the throttle, on the throttle. And um, we have had cars completely stock engine on, mod on championships, we couldn't modify the engines um, with just a different software. And they go on and on and on and on and on, and they, they are reliable. They keep going, they are reliable because they are tuned correctly. If they fail for some reason, the, the cause has been inspected and see why did it fail in the first place. Today, I had a very good example. Um, I went, uh, I met someone today and um, he had two cars in there that I have in the past built an engine for, um, for a similar car. Um, and uh, it had exactly the same problem that uh, the one I rebuilt had. And uh, it was already second engine that had happened that. So the problem, it's the, the car, it's, um, 207 GTI, which is the same engine as a Mini Cooper S, the R56, the 1.6 turbo. And uh, the engine had a ring line failure. So it broke a piston the first time, and then he rebuilt it and happened again, broke another piston. The one I done for my customer, exactly the same. It broke a piston on the ring line. Why this happens? So this is a, a thing that like uh, I would say all the engine builders know which has to do with the ring gapping. 
And uh, I was trying to explain to him because like, why does it happen then? Why doesn't it come right from the factory? Well, it comes right from the factory, but uh, you see, this is a good example to explain the reliability on it because this is a turbo car. On NAs, it's very different because to make an NA car unreliable, you have to be really bad at it. You have to try really hard to make it bad. Uh, on a turbo, it's different. So the way it works is uh, from the factory, they have to deal with the emissions and performance. They want to have the, the best of both worlds. They want to have as much performance as possible with the lowest emission as possible. So, sorry. Um, what they, they have to do, they have to work around the, the, the ceiling on the, on the piston. So there's less uh, pressure loss to the crankcase. So they work with a certain tolerance. Now, the tolerance it comes from the factory, it's good enough. It's, it's, it works well for the standard boost. Uh, because what happens is when you tune it, uh, it happens on all the engines. Like the way it, why it makes more power is because you're increasing the cylinder pressure of it. Um, more cylinder pressure, more temperature, you know, everything goes up. So what will happen is when you increase cylinder pressure on it and temperature, the piston rings start to expand okay and uh, as you know you guys know the shape of a, it's like the seat and they never touch themselves so there's a you cannot really see here i'll make it more obvious okay so this is what it looks like when it starts expanding the gap in here gets smaller and smaller so with standard boost on that um, cylinder pressure they are gap to work on they are fine they're always going to work never going to fail you increase cylinder pressure on it uh, increase the temperature and the ring is going to go start growing till it butts with the other one when it meets the other one it's the recipe for disaster because from the moment they meet each other they have no place to go it cannot grow anymore it, it has the you know, it's against the boards, so it just cannot grow anymore. So what it does, it just does this, pushes up or down, and that breaks the ring land. This is why. And the, I said to the guys that if you don't gap them right, you know, and it's very important on a turbo, it, it's very unlikely for it to last. You have to wrap, gap it with a higher uh, ring gap than the, the factory has, so that doesn't happen again. Because otherwise, it will just keep on happening all the time. It's there's no no. The thing is, people think I'll put forced pistons, and uh, hopefully sorts out the problem. Will not break pistons anymore, right? If your piston broke on a ring land, it's more likely to be the the piston ring the cause of the failure than the piston itself. All because of this that I just explained to you. Of course. A piston can fail as well under pressure, but you have that's why I say you have to analyze it and see. But usually ring lands, I would say 90% of the time on a boosted car or nitrous car. Um, it's going to be to, due to the lack of uh, of clearance on the rings. So you need to increase the ring gap. And uh, that is it. So it, this is a case where the modifying the, the engine, it's... Um, it's important to, to know. So I'm going to look for more questions. Um, okay, now we got one from Josh. Great video as usual, really food for thought. Wondering if there's any any benefits from the Venturi effect with regards to the port speed and whether the advantages is, or advantages or just other restriction. If Air likes to travel straight lines to focus more on the port floor and short radius, try to make air travel in more of a straight line or the port roof in order to straighten out the radius of the turn. You spoke about uh, reading material previously. I tried to find a video with those books, but I failed. There is any chance you could put the list in the description of for next video. Always love learning more. Yeah, we all, we all do like learning more, all of us now. Venturi effects. Venturi have most ports uh, of the factory. They have them. It's um, it's uh, how do you call it? I forgot the name. A choke. The choke area. Okay. Now, 
The thing is, for a road car, that choke area can be quite accentuated. On a performance car, it's not going to be as much. For example, an S54 doesn't have a choke thing. It's just a normal cylinder head. And guess what? It still works really well. They will work well. But uh, the, 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 the problem is on... Um, it's not when you are flat out that you're going to notice that. Is when you're not flat out, when you have low port speed, when there's no, not enough load. This is when it starts showing it doesn't have it. Um, so if, if you have a head with uh, no, no choke on it and it has the same exact head with choke, it's, it will be on the lower RPM range, as you would notice. So the throttle response, the way the car reacts to the throttle, is not flat out. So this is the thing. When you remove it, it's plain and simple. The more air you get into that cylinder, the better it is. So they are really not thought for flat out applications. This is one of the performance engines on the, like from factory, they have very little or none choke area because they want as much flow as possible through the port. So this is the thing is more flow equals more power ultimately. And this is why I explained to you guys before, like when I was talking about the port speed. Port speed is important, but if you can uh, sacrifice a little bit of, sort of port speed on the head itself uh, to gain a decent amount of CFM, perfect. It's like, as I said, it's a good balance. Like, for example, you can, if you have a head that has CFM with an average port speed of, uh, sorry, Let's say 200 again, 300, sorry. Okay. If you say, ah, I found an area that I can get it to 270, but port speed drops down to 250. That's not worth doing. Because you're, gaining, you're not going to gain that much for the port speed you're going to lose. It's not really a great move because it means you can make more peak power, but you're going to have less average power because you're not going to be making as much torque. This is the thing this is where it's very important to balance it, you know. So you gain 10 CFM at the cost of 50 feet per second. You weigh it out. You see, like, um, where you want to be, you know. You find it. Just if those 10 BHP or 12 BHP are that crucial, yeah, go for it. But, uh, again, it's the average sports speed that is going to make you faster. So that's the thing, you know. So I was, I prefer to have a better port speed, like, and try always to find the best compromise. So I, I cover that area already a lot. Um, you guys have to think wisely and uh, tune an engine, tune it wisely, think wisely. Spend more time thinking about what you want. And remember one thing, there's no as without loss. You simply cannot do that. Or you can up to a, a, an extent, and then it comes to a point you cannot. And if you're modifying a car that is already a performance car out of the factory, it makes it even more the case because they're already pushed to a different level. And they are right on the limit of the edge between having it drivable and uh, having the power. And uh, where we'll see things like where this CFM and power and port speed um, comes into hand. Josh, um, he sent me another text. Um, not on the, it's not on the on the live chat. Um, and we he has a, a DC5. Now he has a different car. Uh, DC5 is the engine I spoke about before. They make great CFM. They make a big power numbers. And uh, he said something that I, well, I knew it's, it's, it's normal because I had a DC5 myself. I know what they are like. They have, they, it has really good power, but it was not really, it didn't feel that uh, exciting in, on acceleration. And he said, uh, in terms of power, the, the DC5, the Integra DC5, has uh, more power than the current car has. But he said the 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 Integra couldn't uh, keep up with the with the Clio, uh, because it, the reason for this is the the Clio, which is the car he has now, has more average power than what the Integra did, 
also it can accelerate from a much lower RPM than what the interrail could. This is the thing, is when you start really realizing, actually, to make it go faster, I have to go slower almost, or just forget the BHP number of it and just focus more on having a best ratio BHP torque that I can, so average power. So this is the thing, you know, it, it's it's one of those. So that is the, the, the way I see it, at least, you know, and the, all these years I've been doing engines, and the, the more of them I do, the more I come to the conclusion, the power that someone says the engine has says nothing to me, zero. I cannot ever judge how fast a car is just looking at the power number. And so I need to see the full printout to understand how good the car is. If I see a strong torque line, I know it's going to be a strong car. If I see a torque line that just makes a big number, I know it's not going to be fast at all. Um, and just people just think having a bigger power number means the car is going to be crazy quick. Mm, it's not really the case. It's not the way it works. So that's the thing. It has a lot more to make a vehicle fast than just the, the power number number it puts out. And the, like the, the reason I do these videos is trying to kill some misconceptions people have. And this is really the main thing is to kill misconceptions and to to explain it with science behind it. And uh, the other thing is, like, I, I love when people say this, the old saying, there's no replacement for displacement. And the thing I love the most is when people really say it, and then it's people that I know they have bigger engines and now they now have smaller engines, uh, it just makes no sense. And the, the truth is there is replacement for displacement and it's called dynamic. If you have something that is dynamically better, it can replace displacement very easily. You know, of course, you cannot go to extreme cases, but if there's, that wasn't applicable, even it, but it covers any ground on motorsport, we wouldn't have the cars we have nowadays. And uh, today, someone posted a video, uh, Groupie Rally Cars. Who doesn't like them? I have no idea who doesn't. I love the sound of the things. It was just, uh, I, I said on the video, emo, emo, emotion button was always on on those cars. It was just crazy. But I, then I written a fact that the guy, everyone, they, it cannot be disagreed, which is the car, the rally cars that have the most power ever, but the, the new 1.6 cars are still faster. They have less power, less displacement. They are faster. Why? Because they are much better dynamically. I know things moved up, but this is the thing. Everything has moved up. While in the past, let's say 30 years ago, to get uh, 150 bhp per liter was an achievement. Nowadays, we have 150 bhp per liter on NA cars, um, on quite a lot of supercars, loads. It's really crazy the way it went. Before, 30 years ago, only race engines could do it. Now you do it on a car that it can be used on the road. Of course, all became possible due to the technology that can be used. And that, therefore, it existed, the downsizing. And like, if you guys know, nowadays, every, all the engines are becoming smaller. They're recurring to, tar they recurring to the turbo. And like NA engines is really something that I, unfortunately, I start to see as a dying art, especially tuning NA engines. Nowadays, you don't have no hot hatch that is NA. It doesn't exist. And the, even when I done the one series, I just wanted a rear wheel drive hot hatch NA. This is why I made it. And uh, you cannot get anything. What, a, a 130i? It's not really, I, I consider it a, more of a cruiser than a hot hatch. It, it doesn't feel the same. You drive a 130i, drive a 116, 116 feels nice. It just doesn't have the power. And I was like, okay, so I want the power of the 130 on the 116, and that's me sorted. And that's that's why I started doing it. I done it for me to have fun with it and because it was a challenge to start with something. Um, and in the end, the result is awesome. I, I haven't uh, took anyone out on it that didn't like it, that everyone loves it, loves the concept of it. It's perfect. Um, so this is the thing. It's NAs nowadays, unfortunately. It's a, a dying thing, which is very sad. You, you see mostly, very rarely now there's a new car coming out like a performance car, proper performance car that is NA. doesn't exist no more. 
It's very unfortunate, but it's the truth. So for us NA diehards, it's very hard to swallow, but I still keep on working on our NAs. And then more and more, I have people asking me to build servos, which I do happily, but it's not quite the same. And that's it. So anyway, guys, question time. I need you guys to ask questions, but today we have a very small field. We only five today, which is a lot less than what we usually are. So any questions? I'm going to have uh, just a sip on my tea. No one likes to ask questions today. What a, the crowd today is not happy. No questions. <laughs> okay, there's no questions. Teach me something then. Yay. If you can theoretically get the most amount of air in a cylinder, uh -huh. this is a good question. And this was covered by someone before. Um, so, if you theoretically get more amount of air in the cylinder with five valves, we don't see it no more because of the way it's placed on the cylinder. So, for starters, five valves was something that was proven to work, but the gain is very minimal for the gain in the valve train mass. And of course, on the valve train, you want to have as less moving parts as possible. And adding another valve, the benefit was not really that big. Very few engines, very few five cylinder, um, five valves per cylinder were made because the gain was not that good. And then what reinforced the fact of them not existing anymore is the direct injection. With direct injection, there's no room for a fifth valve. Um, also, the thing they had to have, because of the placement of them, the cap shafts were very tricky to make because they had to be off-centered because the valves, they don't sit all on the same line. So you got one valve is here and the other two are right in front of it. So you see the, the challenge it is to design a camshaft to work with them. And then the other thing, it has to open at slightly different time because it's closer to the edge of the piston. The piston also has to have a different cut. It's very like it overcomplicates things for the game. So it overcomplicates by, by let's say, 40% when it only gains 10%, it writes it off straight away. This is why it's not used. So that's the thing. You know, the, the ideal thing would be for to have as many intake valves as possible. So you get all the air you can in. But at the same time, you have to see what is going to affect, how it's going to, you got to make it possible. You know, so it's possible, but it's not uh, really ideal. And again, with direct injection, it just uh, killed that a bit more because it's just not a viable option. Any updates on the cams for the two liter? Unfortunately, no. <laughs> so we, at the moment, we're suffering a lot with the massive delays. Um, it's it's getting a bit crazy. It's driving me a bit nuts because there's a lot of work that uh, I would like to have delivered that I, I still ma didn't manage to deliver because of the crazy amount of delays there are. It's not only the lockdown. <clears throat> it's the fact that uh, uh, Brexit happened. Things coming from abroad are just not working as fast. Now I've noticed they are coming back to normal. <clears throat> Because I sent, sent a few things last week, they arrived already, and I received something that was sent to me just on the week before. But uh, things that were done on early January, it's a big nightmare, really big nightmare. So, Mercury Ace, I hope I answered your question well. Um, anyway, guys, we are close to an hour, and uh, today we are a small class. People are not interacting as much. So, um, I don't know if, like, what could I carry on with, but as I said, we are close to an hour of video. So, I'm going to wrap it up in here. Um, thank you for the, 
the view. Thank you for your time as well. I hope you enjoyed this video. It was a bit different. It was more like uh, re, re going back and talking a little bit about things we spoke already. But I don't want to do this too often because it's just going to become repetitive. It's just I wanted to clarify a few things. Uh, so you don't misuse the the information you got now. You know it's very easy to to misuse it and uh, try to look at things and then say oh it doesn't work. So this is the reason why I decided to talk about it. So anyway, I'll see you guys next one Monday. I'm going to prepare a really nice subject. I'm not sure yet what uh, what yet I should say, <laughs> but I'll try to bring something up to plan. Uh, Leave ideas for it on the comments as usual, and then I'll try to to discuss it next time. So, guys, have a nice one. Thank you very much for the support. Don't forget, uh, like, uh, subscribe, share. It it will mean the world to me. So, I really would like to get to the thousand subscribers at least, so I could start some more interesting content on it. And. Uh, because then I can just do lives on the phone uh, while I'm out. And uh, it, I think it will be far more interesting because I can get you guys involved on other things. That is not just me sitting on a lap, looking at a laptop and uh, with a board behind me. So help, uh, help us get into the thousand subscribers so we can start bringing more interesting content to the, to the channel. Thank you once again. I'll see you on the next one. Bye bye.